definitely good to be here, and I appreciate the invitation that Lee has given me. I have to resist a very, very strong temptation uh, because of so many of these speakers who have had a tremendous impact on my life. Lee and I were talking with Reggie last night and how in our very first ministries, we took his How to Win a Soul record and virtually followed it, and he helped us learn how to become personal evangelists that way. And uh, so I've, I've just got to move from that because I could get hung up and stay right there on those kinds of things uh, all morning. But thank you for the opportunity to come. I want to know how many of you have ever visited the city of Jerusalem. Let's see your hands. Quite a few. Quite a few. You know, there was a time a few years back when churches would often give their preacher, in view of some anniversary or some special event, a trip to the Holy Land. One Sunday night at Georgetown, the service was over, and the chairman of the elders came walking down the aisle and called me back to the front and asked Pat to come down too. And we got down there in front, and he made some comments and handed me an envelope. It happened to be the year of my 10th anniversary with the church, our 20th wedding anniversary, the 20th anniversary of my ordination, and the year our son was graduating from high school all at once. And so he said, in honor of all of these things, the church would like to give you this trip. And it was a 10-day trip in which they paid for the plane tickets for all of us. They paid entirely for our hotel expenses. They paid for all of our meals, and they even gave us spending money. I opened up the envelope, saw that. It was a trip to Honolulu. When the service was over, one of the elders, jokingly, I hope, came to me, and he said, Jerry, we seriously considered sending you to the Holy Land, but we thought you fit better in Honolulu. <laughs> so I've never been to Jerusalem. But I've talked to Christian tourists who have come back from Jerusalem, and probably some of you would say the same thing, and you report how that visit to Jerusalem impacted your spiritual lives and also specifically the emotions you experienced as you visited what are called those holy sites. Well, I want to tell you something. If you had come back from Jerusalem in the year 450 B.C., that's not the kind of a report you would have brought back. It was neither a beautiful nor an inspirational city at that time. The physical condition was discouraging, and the attitudes of the people were disheartening. The physical activity in Jerusalem at that time was virtually non-existent. The walls had been destroyed and they still lay in rubble. Not many homes had been rebuilt. It appears that there was a lack of citizens and a lack of commercial activity at the time, and that had gone on for decades. There'd been an attempt to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, starting with the temple by Zerubbabel, but when the king did a little research on the history of the Jews, he decided that wasn't too wise a move, and so he put a stop to it instantaneously. The social situation wasn't any better than the physical situation. These were a discouraged people, and they were reminded daily that they were conquered and they were forced into servanthood. They were in disgrace in the eyes of the people around them, and it had become so negative that even these Jews had begun mistreating each other and taking advantage of each other. The spiritual situation was equally bad. These discouraged and disgraced people were involved mostly in surface religious activity. There didn't seem to be any evidence of a real depth of commitment at, in their lives, and adhering to the law of God was not real high on their list of priorities. There were two words that you would use if you returned from Jerusalem in 450 B.C. You would say it was dead and it was hopeless. And then, suddenly and unexpectedly, something dramatic happened. This group of unorganized and discouraged people, unmotivated and disgraced people, became 
an effective working team. These unequipped people suddenly had all of the resources they needed to tackle this major task of massive dimensions. Reconstruction, which had previously been opposed by this very same king, now received his full support. Unmotivated Israelites laid everything aside, ignored their feelings of being disgraced and discouraged and standing shoulder to shoulder. They stood up and said, let us rise up and build. In just 52 days, these downtrodden people, self-defeated people, accomplished an astounding accomplishment, one of the most remarkable feats in the history of God's people. Some would say in the history of the world. They rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. And in fact, people who had been in opposition to them stood in awe and amazement. Now, there's one question that demands an answer. What happened? What happened? What produced this dynamic conversion of the entire culture resulting in a change of the physical situation, the social situation, and the spiritual situation? And the answer is just one word. Nehemiah. Nehemiah. The entire scenario took on a completely different appearance because of the life and the leadership and the work of just one man, and a most unlikely man at that. He was, in one sense, an outsider. He lived 800 miles away from the problem, further than from here to Reggie's hometown, 700 miles. Here was a man who appeared to be completely inexperienced. There's not one single bit of evidence to suggest he had ever led anything. Here was a man who had given no indication that he had great in-depth knowledge, skill, or understanding of the relevant situation in Jerusalem and what it would take to straighten it out. This was an unimportant man. He was a servant. Yes, servant of the king. But nonetheless, he was just a servant. And yet, when you look at this from a human perspective, this one man was solely responsible for the complete turnaround of the circumstances in Jerusalem and the surrounding area. The history of Jerusalem, the history of the Jewish people changed because of Nehemiah. Why? What was there about Nehemiah that made him the catalyst which completely changed the entire physical, spiritual, and social environment in the city of Jerusalem? How could this unknown servant of the king accomplish the unbelievable? Well, the question is, why do we even need to know? I believe we need to know it for this reason. It's important that we know why Nehemiah was successful. Because we need some contemporary Nehemiahs. We need some people who will effectively recognize the opportunities that exist in the problems we face and will step up and, like Nehemiah, lead people to godly solutions. And so for that reason, this message has two objectives. The first is to challenge you personally to become a contemporary Nehemiah. And the second is to introduce to you the process through which Nehemiah became that catalyst that totally changed the circumstances in Jerusalem. You can turn to your Bibles to the first two chapters of Nehemiah. We'll be referring to them. Sometimes I'll just give you the reference. We won't read it. You can look at it as we're speaking But here we're going to find out what it was that made Nehemiah the kind of a person he was. And it all begins with those verses that were read before I spoke from the first four verses. And you might also look at the 10th verse where we discover that Nehemiah acknowledged the seriousness of the situation. 
He'd been far removed from Jerusalem geographically, but his heart was with the people in Jerusalem. And he was greatly downcast by the condition of what he heard about Jerusalem. And so he was touched emotionally in a big way. And the scripture says he wept over Jerusalem. And he fasted for days and perhaps even weeks. His tears were flowing because Nehemiah truly understood the condition of his people. He recognized that these people were not where they should be in their relationship with God. And he wept for days, he fasted for days, and that shook him to the very core of his being. He's not the first or last one to have felt that way about his people. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, said, Since my people are crushed, I am crushed. I mourn. And horror grips me. The Apostle Paul said, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart over the condition of my people. And of course, we all remember the words of Jesus as he looked out over Jerusalem and how he expressed heartfelt sorrow over their spiritual blindness. I think there's a legitimate question to be laid on the table for us today that fits in very well with where Reggie left off. Are we weeping over the spiritual condition of our people? Individuals, congregations, perhaps our movement? Is there deep heartfelt concern driving us to our knees in tears over the spiritual dullness of so many people in our modern churches? E.M. Bounds in his book, Bible Men of Prayer, wrote, How few the strong men in these days who can weep at the evils and the abominations of the times. How rare those who are sufficiently interested and concerned for the welfare of the church to mourn. Mourning and weeping over the decline of revival power and the fearful inroads of worldliness in the church are almost an unknown quality. And he goes on, leaders have no eyes to see the breaking down of the walls of Zion and the low spiritual state of the Christians of the present day, and they have even less heart to mourn and cry about it. Somebody said a long time ago, you can tell the character of a person by what makes them laugh and what makes them cry. Well, what makes you laugh? What makes you cry? If we're going to be contemporary Nehemiahs, the spiritual numbness of people of our day must begin to weigh heavily upon our heart and drive us in heartfelt concern to our knees. But that wasn't the only reason he cried. Tears flowed from Nehemiah because he understood God's big picture, which you read about in verses 5 through 9. This man of God knew what it was all about. He knew this wasn't about the walls in Jerusalem. He knew this wasn't about the condition of the buildings. He knew this was not about the discouragement of the people. He knew this was about the relationship of these people to God. It was about their submission to God. It was about their humble obedience to God. It was about their desire to give honor and glory to God. He was a man who understood the true spiritual significance of this situation, even though the people didn't. He realized how far removed these people were from where they should be in God's big picture. He knew the fundamental things that needed to happen. He knew his people needed to become humble, loving, obedient servants of God. I want to ask you, do we really understand God's big picture? Do we realize that God's big picture is much bigger and much broader and much deeper than most of the things we devote our time and our ability and our talents and our money to in the average church. I think we face a major problem in the church today. Oh, it's true, there are some churches that are showing signs of life through their evangelism and their beneficent ministries. We heard a couple preachers earlier in this program tell about what's happening in their churches. and We rejoiced with the growth and the life that they described. But I want to tell you something. 
85% of the churches are not in that category. They're just sitting there spinning their wheels where they've been spinning them for five years, 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years. Oh, they've made some changes. They may have even built new buildings, but it's the same old church on the inside just sitting there spinning its wheels. We see that and we start debating the reasons for it. We say, well, it's because of the music style or it's because of the shallow preaching or it's because of too much emphasis on the programming or it's because of too much lack of, or a, a, a lack of evangelism and we keep adding to the list a host of other things. And all of those things may very well be connected to the problem, but folks, they don't represent the fundamental deep down in the center heart and core of the issue. What is that issue? It seems in my judgment, a very large percentage of the people in our churches don't know what it's all about. They just don't have the big picture. They have no concept of it. And because of that, they don't understand the true condition of God's people. They have little concern about what's really happening at the core of their ministries. In fact, they don't even realize that the possibility exists that they could be exactly like the people that Jesus spoke of in the Sermon on the Mount when he described people who were actively involved in legitimate spiritual activities and at the very same time were totally disconnected from God. If, like Nehemiah, your move by the true condition of the people, and you do understand God's big picture, then your soul should be overcome by a genuine heartfelt concern that will lead you to move yourself toward becoming a contemporary Nehemiah. But that's going to take something that seemed to be pretty natural with Nehemiah. He was completely connected personally with God. In the 11th verse, notice, he prayed, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant. Nehemiah connected with God through regular communication with God. Time and again, we see Nehemiah as he's confronting real-life situations, turning to God in prayer. When he saw the big picture and was overwhelmed by God's big picture. The first thing he did was to turn to God in prayer. When he stood before the king and needed instantaneous courage and wisdom, he turned to God in prayer. When he was facing opposition from people outside the city of Jerusalem, he turned to God in prayer. When he was being tempted by people from within the city of Jerusalem, he turned to God in prayer. And when he was confronting his own people, who had fallen away from their commitments to obedience of God's commands back into their sinful ways, he turned to God in prayer. Folks, Nehemiah was a man of great power and influence and effectiveness because he regularly used the most powerful tool that has ever been placed in the hands of a human being, and that is the ability to communicate directly with the God of the universe and seek his wisdom and his empowerment for his purposes. And it's only to the degree that we will begin to duplicate in our lives that kind of direct communication with God as practiced by Nehemiah that we'll see ourselves become effective contemporary Nehemiahs. But that wasn't all. He connected with God by being open to God's guidance and empowerment. Nehemiah knew this wasn't his job, it was God's job. And so he willingly and he humbly put himself in the hands of God, praying, give your servant success. Nehemiah had been made an earthly servant by force, by an earthly king. So he understood servanthood. And now, he voluntarily goes to God and offers himself as a servant of the king of the universe. And he asks that king to lead the way and to work through his life. Now, Nehemiah was a man of great ability and talent, even though there was nothing to reveal that that we know of. In earlier years, he was a good thinker, he was a wise analyzer, he was a skilled planner, he was a capable organizer, he was a powerful motivator, he was a strong teacher, and when necessary, he could be a spiritual disciplinarian. He was an outstanding leader. 
So much so that even our modern business world acknowledges that. And the result of this is our tendency is to examine Nehemiah's record and focus on those skills and those abilities. And when we do that, we miss the most important point about his life. We must be very certain to observe that one major characteristic of Nehemiah's life and his leadership practice that made him effective. Nehemiah always recognized and acknowledged the real power behind his abilities and his accomplishments. Every step of the way, Nehemiah not only turned to God for guidance, but he always gave God the, the credit publicly and openly. He, was, he had a never wavering focus on God and multiple times he directed the attention of his people to God. In the second chapter, the 11th verse, he told them what God had put in my heart to do. And in the 18th verse, he says, I told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me. In the 20th, he answered them saying, the God of heavens will give us success. You go over to the fourth chapter, the 14th verse, and he tells them, remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And in the 20th verse, he says, our God will fight for us. Not one time did Nehemiah ever take any credit for himself. Long before the apostle Paul wrote the words to the Corinthians, Nehemiah did it all for the glory of God. And even before Paul wrote to the Philippians, Nehemiah knew it was God working in him, both to will and to act according to God's good purpose. In everything he did, Nehemiah kept himself and he kept his people focused on and connected with God. And if any of us wants to become a contemporary Nehemiah, we're only going to succeed to the degree that we maintain our own personal connection with God by first of all, heeding the words of Paul to pray without ceasing about every circumstance we face by always turning to God for guidance and for empowerment, and by always giving God the credit for everything he produces through our lives and through our influence. Influence. That's the next thing we see in Nehemiah's life. He deliberately exerted his influence for God. We see it at the end of the 11th verse, uh, end of the first chapter, and the second chapter. It's an astounding use of influence when you stop and think about it. He's a Jew. He's an enslaved Jew, a conquered Jew, a servant, and yet he uses his influence on a pagan king, one of the most powerful men in the world at that time and one who had shut down a similar project in previous years when he issued an order for these men to stop their work, and he gave the reason he didn't want that city rebuilt. He said, why should I let this threat grow to the detriment of royal interests? And Scripture tells us he compelled them by force to stop. The mere suggestion that Nehemiah could get this king to do anything to help Jerusalem seems ridiculous. But the influence of this lowly, unknown servant with this pagan king completely reversed his position. And the king didn't just say, okay, Nehemiah, you want to go back to Jerusalem, go back and build your house. The king provided him with all the resources necessary and even more resources than what was necessary to go beyond what anybody could have imagined. Now, why did Nehemiah succeed with his influence? Well, first of all, Nehemiah admitted to himself that he was in a position to have effective influence. He went to God and he prayed. Give your success, servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. Now, when you look at that prayer and, and you question, you analyze it, you discover he's referring totally to the potential power of his own influence. He's saying, God, I realize I'm in a position to influence this king. Now I want you to give me success. 
Folks, there isn't a person in this room that can say, I'm not an influencer. Not a person. Every living person is in a position to influence others. You are an influencer. My last Sunday at Christ Church at Georgetown, before going to Great Lakes, I was standing at the door shaking hands as people walked out. And I was given something by a little eight-year-old boy who I had very little contact with. Our youth minister was basically and handled all of the elementary kids, 150 plus kids. I'd see them in the hall and speak to them and that was pretty much my contact with this one. And as he walked out, he handed me this beat up little paper bag. And I mean it was beat up as torn halfway down the side. And on the front, he had pasted a piece of paper that said to Jerry Paul from Jonathan, May 26, or May 22nd, 1994. And as he handed it to me, he said, thanks, Jerry, for being my preacher. And when I opened it up, inside, there was a penny sucker, a nickel, a dime, a tiny rock and a little bigger rock that looked like they might have come from Yellowstone, and a little plastic worm that had printed on it, we all want to go to heaven. And folks, I took that to Great Lakes. My secretary is sitting here. She can tell you this is the truth. The day I walked in that office and organized it, I set that paper bag on the credenza behind my desk. And after five years at Great Lakes, I took it with me back to Fort Wayne, and it was in the office of the new church that we started. And when I left that church in 2005 to do what I'm doing now, I took that paper bag, and it now sits three feet from my desk on a bookshelf. And every day of my life, I look at that paper sack from that eight-year-old boy, and it reminds me I'm an influencer. My friend, you are an influencer. And when you recognize that, you will soon be utterly amazed at who, when, and where your influence can make a difference. Sometimes you'll be fully aware of it right away. Other times it'll be decades later. Why, just within the last 24 hours. I'm reminded of a revival meeting I was preaching. And I recall that night when this little three, four, five-year-old kid out there was just raising cane, and his, I thought his mother was handing him to the people in the row ahead of him. And instead, I've learned that Lee Mason today is the director of CRA, the editor of the Restoration Herald, a preacher known throughout the nation, and is married to Karen because that night, as he told us last night at the banquet, his mother raised him up and said, look, there is Jerry Paul. You just never know how great your influence is going to be. I never knew about that. 52 years it took me to find out how powerful that influence was that night. The power of your influence can change individual lives. It can change the attitudes of groups. It can change the directions of organizations. And if you want to become, become a contemporary Nehemiah, the first thing you have to do is admit you do have influence. But take the next step too. Nehemiah put himself in God's hands and he turned everything over to God and he let God work through him and he prayed, give your servant success. Nehemiah just saw himself as God's tool. And God took this tool of Nehemiah's influence and he changed the course of Jewish history. It's rather interesting. Back there in the Old Testament, we have Nehemiah acting out the words of Paul that he wrote to the Corinthians when he was explaining that we're the Lord's ambassadors of reconciliation. You see, Paul told them that, that when we take this message of reconciliation to people around us, it is as though God is working, is making his appeal through us. 
And when Nehemiah stood before King Artaxerxes and he announced his concern and his desire and about the needs of the people back in Jerusalem, it was as though God was making his appeal through Nehemiah. Why? Because first of all, Nehemiah acknowledged he could be an influencer. And then he put himself in God's hands and he said, I'm your servant. Use me as an influencer. And as a Christian servant, you are in a position to exert influence on your brothers and sisters in Christ, on the lives of individuals with the attitudes of groups and the direction of organizations. You can become a contemporary Nehemiah by acknowledging the opportunity that stands before you and simply putting yourself in God's hands and saying, God, work through me. Use me as your tool. Make your servant successful. And when that success begins to unfold, then you need to be like Nehemiah and have a plan, which we read about in the second chapter of the verses 11 through 16. This is the one skill that seems to attract the most attention about Nehemiah from people. Before doing anything else, he surveyed the whole situation and he developed a plan for confronting the problem. And he was a productive influencer as a result of that because he knew what needed to be done and he knew what the detailed plan was for getting the people involved in it. And this is very important. This is very important. Nehemiah developed the plan before he challenged the people. You see, when he went before the people, he knew precisely what he wanted them to do. So when they did respond positively to his call of action, he could put them to work immediately. He wasn't about to lose their enthusiasm and their commitment while he and a bunch of guys went off in a corner of Jerusalem and tried to figure out what these people needed to do to get the job done. He knew that before he challenged them. And every influencer here today who wants to be a contemporary Nehemiah needs to leave this place with a plan. Not a plan to address all the issues, not a plan to get things back on track, not a plan for a dynamic program that's going to completely direct, change the direction of everything in your church. If you want to be an effective influencer, you need to leave this place with a personal plan for yourself. You see, there's something that doesn't show up very clearly here in the Old Testament, but it had to happen. While Nehemiah was making that 800-mile journey from where he was over to Jerusalem, He was making a plan for himself. So the minute he hit Jerusalem, he knew what he was going to do. What specifically are you going to do in order to grasp your own opportunity to be a contemporary Nehemiah? What's going to be your personal plan? You see, we can go to conferences like this many times, and we agree with much of what's been said, and then we go home and talk about it. Well, I want to tell you something. Going home and preaching about this next Sunday isn't going to do the job. People need more than words describing how things are and how they ought to be. Even God's people need guidance on how to get from where things are to what they ought to be. They need somebody to say, and here's how you get through that process. And folks, unfortunately, that's often being left out in our churches. We're doing a good job telling people where where they are. And we're telling people with God's Word a a great job uh, of telling them where they ought to be. But we don't ever give them anything practical to do on how to get from here to here. And Nehemiah had that plan. And if we don't provide a plan like that, nothing's going to change. Because most people don't put those kinds of plans together on their own. What's going to be your next step? It's time for us to stop criticizing the failures and complaining about the problems and condemning the shortcomings of others. It's time to focus on our own concern. It's time to focus on our own connection with God, on our own influence, and to come up with a plan for ourselves individually that makes it possible for us to stand up before people and be contemporary Nehemiahs. Stop worrying about what everybody else ought to be doing and start worrying about what you can do. Be like Nehemiah, put together a personal plan so that you can actively engage other people in Nehemiah and God's work. And then you can be like Nehemiah and enlist motivated partners. 
His success is absolutely amazing. How is he able to challenge these people and get them to work? Well, he did. First of all, he made them aware of their current situation. He said, you see the trouble you're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. And notice how he directed their attention. He didn't criticize them. He didn't berate them. He didn't put them down. He didn't beat them over the head. He just put in front of them a simple, forthright, objective, and reasonable manner what they needed to be doing, or what the situation was, rather. You know, many of our people in the churches really don't know what the situation is. They just don't understand it. They see surface issues. They don't recognize what's going on at the core. And like Nehemiah, we need to find simple and objective and reasonable ways to lay out the problems and discuss them. Nobody's going to help solve a problem that they don't think exists. And so you got to start by helping people become aware of what the present situation really is. And then you can do as Nehemiah did and show them the power behind the project. He says, I told them the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. And it's important to notice this. He held up before the people his own personal experience with God. You know, any person who can say, here is what God has done in my life, and because of this I know he can do it in your life, is going to be effective as a leader. Third-party illustrations are fine, but when you can say, I know we can count on God because God has worked in my life, then we're going to start seeing some effectiveness. And when people saw God's power at work in Nehemiah's life, they were quick to fall in line and start following him. You hold up a specific example in your own life that demonstrates you're connected with God, and people are going to say, hey, I want that happening in my life as well. And then you can be like Nehemiah and call them, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we'll no longer be in disgrace. He was able to call these people to action because he knew this was God's work. He knew from his own experience that God was working in his own life, and he had a plan ready for these people to act upon, and they were ready to follow a capable, God-blessed, and God-empowered leader. And I believe there are many believers out there today that are looking for godly leadership. I can't begin to tell you, and I suspect the other preachers here that travel around and speak have had the same thing happen. How many times I've gone into a church, and I've had people say, we love our preacher. He's a good preacher. We love him. He calls on people. We just wouldn't want to see him go. But you know something? He can't lead. I had an elder get me in the back row, behind the back row one night, and he said to me, while you're here this week, will you try and teach our preacher how to be a leader? He's not a leader. I think there are people just sitting there waiting to be led. The family of God is seeking leaders who will be effective effective influencers for the master. And when they see you are that kind of servant, they're going to be willing to rise up and follow your leadership. In this conference, we have heard words about our individual lives, our congregations, our movement, describing areas where we're strong and Areas where we're weak, we've heard problems that need to be portrayed. We've had problems portrayed. We've had suggestions, uh, solutions suggested, and, and we've had opportunities proposed. But folks, here's the bottom line. When you get up and walk out of this building in a little while, and you go back home to your church, your job, to your community, nothing's going to be different. Nothing will have changed. You've got to go home and do something if you want things changed. You've got to go home and be a contemporary Nehemiah. And if you want to be a contemporary Nehemiah, you can see the same kinds of results. My friend, you can be a contemporary Nehemiah. If you'll recognize the seriousness of the situation and understanding God's big picture, you become deeply and personally concerned about the spiritual welfare of God's people. You can become a contemporary Nehemiah if you'll make sure you are connected personally with God through constant communication and prayer and by opening yourselves up completely to God's leading and God's empowerment. You can become a contemporary Nehemiah if you will deliberately exert your influence for God because you recognize you do have influence. And so you put yourself as a tool in God's hand and say, God, make me a servant that is successful in using my influence. You can become a contemporary Nehemiah if you'll adopt a plan, not to be foisted off on everybody else to make them do what you want them to do, but a plan for your own life so you know where you're going and what you got to do to get there. And you can become a contemporary Nehemiah if you will enlist people 
to become God's partners in God's work by helping them see their current situation, by showing them God will work through their lives because he is in yours, and by calling them to action. You can become a contemporary Nehemiah. On June the 5th, 1994, I walked at 8 o'clock in the morning into the office of the president at Great Lakes Christian College. I walked by the conference table, across the room, around the desk, and sat down for my first full-time day as the president of Great Lakes. The first thing I did was pick up a three by five card and write on it these words, James 1, 5. If any of you desires wisdom, let him ask of God, etc. And I read that and prayed about it. And folks, for the next two hours, I pretty much sat there and twiddled my thumbs because I'd never been the president of college before and I didn't know what I was supposed to do. But at 10 o'clock, a man walked through the door. He had gone to Marie, the president's secretary, the week before and made that appointment. And that man who walked through the door was Dr. Brantley Doty, Mr. Great Lakes Bible College, as they called him, because he had been with the college for over 50 years. Now, I've got to tell you how he affected my life in order to make the illustration meaningful. When I was 17, I had already decided I was going to Ozark. Sam Stone, later the editor at The Standard, had convinced me to go to Ozark. When Lee Doty heard about that, because I lived in Michigan, he approached me saying, I need to stay in Michigan. I need to go to college in Michigan, become a preacher in Michigan. I really wasn't too excited about it, but finally to satisfy him, I agreed to do one thing. That one thing turned into a full-year scholarship at Great Lakes. Well, you don't turn that down, so that's how I ended up at Great Lakes. And in that 30-minute period with Lee Doty, he totally changed the direction of my life from then on. I don't know what would have happened had I gone to Ozark, where I would be. I'm sure I wouldn't be here tonight. Then I sat in his classroom for five years, and everything I learned about the Old Testament, Lee taught me. Then I went back on the staff three years later, and he became my mentor as I helped as being one of the administrators in the public relations department. Then when we lost the president, they made him the temporary president, and he became my boss. He had recruited me. He had taught me. He had mentored me, and he had supervised me. And today, he's sitting in the couch, and I'm in the president's chair. And he's sharing with me his hopes for the future of Great Lakes and why he still believes it can be a good college. And then, folks, we were about through. Lee stood up, and I stood up, and we faced each other. And he reached out, and he took my hand. He said, Jerry, I am your humble servant. Your wish is my command. Folks, God is looking down right now. And he's wanting to hear people say, Father, I am your humble servant. Your wish is my command. And if you're willing to do that and follow the example of Nehemiah who prayed, give your servant success. You can go home from this conference and be a contemporary Nehemiah. You can go home and call people to take up the challenge. And like Nehemiah, you can hear people respond. Let us rise up and build.